I have a special guest here. I've been connected with him for quite some time. I mean, this guy is all over the internet. And in today's podcast, you're going to learn a little bit about real estate. You may learn about coaching and building events and entrepreneurship and fatherhood. But most importantly, you're going to learn some ingredients to dominate 2024. So Jerome, welcome to the show. Like My whole thing is, is there's a level of faith um, that, that you have to have in anything you do in life. And, and the way I feel is like, oh, I can work hard, but I have to trust in God that, there, that, that there's going to be some type of outcome. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I say that is because I, I functioned like that in early years. And I sit back and I go, damn, I've been at this game for 30 years. I've been self-employed and God's never not provided, you know? Right. Um, and not my philosophy is if you're doing things right, you're in the right direction, God will take care of the rest. You just have to be executed. Welcome to season two here at the Trailblazers Talk podcast. I'm so grateful for every subscriber, everybody who's been tapped in with us for the past season. And season two, we are coming out swinging. And in today's podcast, I have a special guest here. I've been connected with him for quite some time. You've probably seen him on Ty Lopez's content. You've probably seen him on any type of real estate ad, event ads, marketing, any type of... uh, event in Vegas, not any type of event, but real estate specific events in Vegas. I mean, this guy is all over the internet. And in today's podcast, you're going to learn a little bit about real estate. You may learn about coaching and building events and entrepreneurship and fatherhood, but most importantly, you're going to learn some ingredients to dominate 2024 in your wealth, in your mindset, in your uh, implementation. This podcast, it's about to go down. So Jerome, welcome to the show, man. Joseph, thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, man, I, I've always, I think we've been trying to get this podcast for like a year now, literally. I think since the last event you had, you had Eric Thomas down here. He was on my podcast. I'm like, yeah, I got to get you on the pod. But of course you're too busy with the event. I I love Eric. Yeah. And I think we did. We tried, we just kind of missed each other's uh, time schedule. Yeah. But you've been been busy with fatherhood and being a parent and stuff. And, uh, and thing is just life just moves but i'm glad i'm here today yeah Appreciate i'm glad that bro. you're here for yeah. the 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 season two launch man like this awesome. this right here is going to set the stage yo so one of the things i've been always curious bro like there's a lot of people on the internet who come out you know whether it's like ads or whatever but like when i first heard about you it was from like oh this guy he's a he's a real estate guru with ty lopez like bro like it's not common for someone to come out the internet like oh you're this guy's guy you're this guru's guy yeah. like how did that even happen um you know we uh i had never been in on the internet until february of 2018 i had never had a facebook page never had an instagram page never had any um desire to have a presence on the internet okay and um i, I started watching some stuff that grant was doing through a mutual friend of mine who had referred um, him over to me and at the time we were working on trying to scale our real estate from utilizing our own capital into raising capital. Mm. And I landed up uh, negotiating with, uh, with Grant. I gave him a $250,000 investment in one of his properties. And my, negotiating, my negotiation was that I wanted backstage passes to one of his 10X comp. Mm. So I landed up um, negotiating that. It was a successful negotiation. I landed up backstage. Um, it's where I met Ty Lopez. I met uh, Grant. I met... Um, Andy Frischella, I met Ed Milet, I met a lot of real big names in the entrepreneur space now, mm-hmm. um, and they were just on their rise at the time, including Grant, you know, yeah. I mean, they, those guys were already doing, I think Ty had the biggest name, and um, I took a liking to Ty right away, um, mainly because um, at the time, when I met him, he, it was kind of like a shucks, golly, G type of approach that he had, um, wasn't a hard sell on anything. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even into social media marketing. Didn't even know anything about it. Mm-hmm. So he didn't really have an interest of my in my brain of like, hey, I, I can utilize this guy's experience to help me scale wealth. Even though I've been had been an entrepreneur for twenty five plus years at mm-hmm. that point in time, it was. Um, but I knew that through proximity of the people that had the largest names, I could scale also my name. Mm. So I used their names as leverage to help me um, in earlier years, which we're still scaling it, right? But in earlier years to take advantage of. And the way I did it is most people go in needy of something. Right. I, um, 
I kind of went in with a big ego. Um, you know, I felt like I'd done well. Um, I felt like I was one of them. You mm-hmm. know, I maybe wasn't known that I was, I wasn't known in the space because I didn't have right. a presence. But I knew I brought some massive value. I had been self-employed forever, and we had been successful being self-employed. So I kind of went in with a, not a Chuck Scully attitude, but um, I knew I could bring some real value to mm-hmm. them. Um, so before I asked for anything from them, because I didn't even know what I needed from them, in all honesty, um, I just I just uh, came in and gave them resources that they mm-hmm. I knew they needed of mine. And, um, and the reason I knew they needed it, because I saw what they were doing, and I was scared for them, because it was being done wrong, mm-hmm. you know, in the real estate space. Um, how the acquisitions were being set up, they were being leveraged. And so all I did is I offered assistance to them for free, you know. Mm. And um, and so I didn't ever ask them for any type of compensation. I didn't need the compensation. We were already doing well, um, you know. And I didn't even know what was going to turn out of it, in all right. honesty. Um, I think sometimes people go in with a ulterior motive where they know, like, they have something that they want for themselves. I didn't even know what I wanted for myself, in all honesty. Mm. I, uh, I just went in and... and uh, and offered assistance. Their attorneys embraced it. Um, Ty embraced it. And um, and over the course of a couple of years, a relationship and business developed mm. and grew. And that's how we became business partners in some of the real estate acquisitions that we own. And um, you know, and that it, it just came from a foundation of giving more than taking. Yeah. And man, you know. that you shared a blueprint. Like I think those who build these really big relationships with uh, big public figures and big entrepreneurs, yep. they all have the same story. They all have the story of I added value with no, uh, with no expectation and just delivering value that they didn't have going the extra mile. Like yeah. with think and grow rich. Napoleon Hill says, yeah. right? Like, do you feel like that's the best way to build these type of relationships? Obviously it worked for you, but like, do you think that's yeah. a really good blueprint to leverage? I think it's different between relationships and it depends where you are in your life. Right. So okay. at that point in time, I didn't feel like I was needy, but I was actually needy in that time. Mm. Um, I, I didn't know. You, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And at that time in my career, I was, I was lost in how, to start raising capital. I didn't realize I needed to build a, uh, a personal brand. Mm. I, I was very naive to it, not naive in business, just naive to what I didn't know, right? right. So at that time, that was the best way to build those relationships okay. was by delivering that value. Uh, so once you have that value, people know who you are. Some of those uh, the other relationships um, get built. Your time becomes narrowed, right? right. So you can't exercise 100% of all those relationships where you just add value, add value, add value. Otherwise, you're working for free and, right. and, and then you, right. um, home suffers, right? Yeah. Your business is at home, you your family, your relationship really at home. So I, I think just being a good person, like um, follow through is important. Yeah. Not over-promising. Um, actions always speak bigger than words, you know, in any magnitude. Um, you know, like even like I was just at Ryan's office. Ryan and I have known each other for a few years. We've tried having dinners together. Our, our same thing, like like you and I. You know, we it's just that I missed Ryan's call, missed him for dinner in Miami one time, and we've just never hit the nail on the head. Like mm. meeting up and talking, hanging out, and but we've always stayed in communication, mm-hmm. right? Like I've always thought of him. I've always made him first of mind when I come to Vegas. I always reach out to someone like Ryan, you know, because I knew what he stood for. I respect what he's done in business. Mm -hmm. So the follow through and um, nurturing those relationships as small as a text message might be, Mm -hmm. uh, what ways it's worth in gold? Because like for his event, when he runs his event, I would just like, when I notice, I see an ad, I might not do it all the time. Right. But let's say I open up my phone to look at my stuff and I see an ad and I know his events that day. I'll say, bro, fucking crush it today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Fucking crush it today. I'm rooting for you, bro. And because no one's doing that. So when I when I th- see something and I recognize it, I just try to let them know that I was thinking about them. Right. You know, or if I see something, like I, I see someone say, "Bro, bro, um, I saw your ad on this and this. That is that ad performing well for you? Yeah. It's fucking incredible. Got my attention. I'll yeah. just let them know like what I saw yeah. from it. Just little stuff like that. Um, and then over the course, it might take two years, three years, and then all of a sudden, um, the world aligns, right? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, like I've done that with commercial brokers and real estate. Um, in like 2008, I, I didn't buy um, an apartment complex till 2016, but I stayed in contact with these guys. Mm. When I had extra time, I'd go to lunch or take them to coffee, you know, and I became That's friends good. with them. 
And, um, and then so even though I hadn't done deals with them, they knew about me. I was telling them about my other deals. I heard about some of their deals. Mm-hmm. We just became friends. And so when I finally got serious in that particular space, those people tended to, they, they would tend to favor me in acquisitions. Right. Um, or if they didn't favor me, they at least paid attention to me. Right. You know? So it's the way I've done a lot of business over the course of time. And uh, my wife always says, you know, it seems like you always pay attention to the people that um, you can benefit from. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's life, right? Like um, people, um, I mean, friends come and go, like over the course of time. Right. Um, but relationships that you exercise are where they're actually built. Yeah. You know, like I don't know if they'll be one of my best friends. All I know is that in the moment, there's something, there's attributes I can deliver to them. And there's yeah. attributes from them that I can also benefit from. And that's kind of the way life is built. Yeah. I mean, I like that. I like what your wife said. Like, well, I like the, what, where you put your attention to could either benefit you or wouldn't benefit you. Like a lot of people put attention to people that don't benefit them. Yeah. yeah. And then they live a really bad life. Like what you said, that's a game of life. Like I think it yeah. is a game. Like if you're intentional, like, hey, I'm going to build relationships from people that I could get clients from, that I could add value yeah. to, that they could get there's add value to me. There's nothing wrong with that. No, because I'll take because I know that I've done the same. Like I know that someone needs me. Yeah. And I'll take advantage of them. Like I'll take advantage of some of the times even free labor or yeah. or um, or labor in general just from yeah. good people that wouldn't otherwise work for me or be around me if I couldn't offer and deliver them some type of value as well. Right. Um, so we've gotten some strong employees and um, and team members from. Um, from the contrary, yeah. you know, and they're th- and and don't kid yourself. They're not there because they just you, you offer these amazing personality traits. They're there because they're in need of something for them and their 100%. family. Yeah. So you got to recognize it. And at the end of the day, if you walk away with a handful of really close friends in your life, you, you're blessed. Yeah. You know, That's and the good. rest, you just respect everybody else. I like that. comes that. to your path. I like that, yeah. man. I think. <clears throat> all entrepreneurs need to have that mindset because sometimes it can be guilty like oh i don't want to take advantage of you but the truth is like we're all taking advantage of each other to some degree yeah and it's not really taking advantage right so like it's it's um you know it's kind of like jesus with his disciples right like i mean did he take advantage of them? he needed them yeah you know they're the ones that spread the word of christianity but i mean did um um you know and they needed him and he needed them it's the same thing you know yeah i mean um it's just you don't. There, it ain't. T- you take advantage of the resources that are around you. God always provides, right? One hundred percent. And I, I just always believe that. Like my whole thing is, is there's a level of faith um, that that you have to have in anything you do in life. And and the way I feel is like I'll, I can work hard, but I have to trust in God that there that, that there's going to be some type of outcome. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I say that is because I, I function like that in early years. And I sit back and I go, damn, I've been at this game for thirty years. I've been self-employed. And God's never not provided, you know? Right. Um, and I, my philosophy is if you're doing things right and you're moving in the right direction, God will take care of the rest. You just have to be executing in the right direction. Yeah. No, that's you know? truth, man. And I do believe God blesses people through people. Yeah. So, like, if there's the right people for you, like, there it is. There's your blessing. Yeah. 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 In so many different ways. People. Yeah. Um, you know, opportunities. Um, everything, you know, and, uh, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of what we do comes through people, like even our deal flow through real estate, mm-hmm. everything, it comes, it comes through who we know and who yeah. respects us, but it's how you exercise those and how you nurture those relationships that, um, really depicts whether those relationships and knowing those people are going to hold any weight and value. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most people are about them. So they, it's all weight heavy in their benefit. Man, that's so good, man. I'm glad that we talked about that. Cause I think just those few minutes ha- hold so much wisdom that everyone that's listening here, but yo, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, the next thing I want to kind of go over, we said it earlier about like events and stuff, bro. Like I know you're killing it in real estate. Like I know you have a lot of different ventures in real estate, but like you're also killing it in the event space. I think you're one of the top guys who are throwing events and not just doing hundreds of people. Like your last event had thousands of people. Like how did you go from real estate to I think I'm going to go into the personal branding space, I don't really know what this is, to then killing it with events. How'd that happen? Yeah, so I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't quite call it killing it yet, you know. Um, I, we, um, there's always a le- – everything's in levels, right? So I, I didn't know – you don't know what you don't know. Right. And, um, but anything that you put your energy into should be 100%, right? So I, And I teach my kids this. 
how you do one thing is how you do everything in life. So if you, and I, I'm known for real estate, but truth be told, I've been an entrepreneur and I own a lot of stuff in a lot of different mm. facets, you know, in different industries. And, and, uh, I, I really consider myself just a, a, a whole, you know, entrepreneur at heart, but real estate has been my claim to fame because it's just where we've crushed it at the, at the highest level mm -hmm. in most people's minds. Right. Um, I like to be thought of as just a good dad and a good husband, hopefully more than anything. And hopefully I'm crushing it in that, at that level, at the highest right. level, because that's really what's most important to me. Amen. But, um, but you know, um, yeah. So I set an example for my kids. Um, I try to set an example for my staff. Um, I was taught in an early age that people will always do what you do, not what you say. Mm. So anytime I do anything, it has to be 110%. And if I don't put 110% into it, I, I'm not doing it. Right. And if you're going to work for me, damn it, you better freaking be willing to put 110% so in. So when did you realize you wanted to go 110% and throw in events? Was it like a money inspiration? Was it like people inspiration? Like, Did you feel like you're oh, helping more people? By throwing events, I still don't want to be in the event space. I'm just there, <laughs> That's bro. <funny. laughs> no, yeah, man. I um, I don't know that I ever decided that I wanted to give it 110 percent of the event space. It's just that I'm doing it. It was, it was, it seemed like it was needed in building the personal brand, um, and it was, it was a tool and a resource that I had it leverage to build and develop our personal brand, okay. and I utilized it as a tool to raise capital for our real estate to scale our real estate and, uh, and our bandwidth and everything that we were doing. So I did a small event, and it was good. Um, you know, it worked out well. Um, five years ago, we had 100 people in the room. Okay. Um, then I, the next year, we had COVID, so we did a virtual event and had like 1,400 people live at any given time, which nice. we crushed it. Yeah. Um, and that was all just marketing. I think we just got lucky because people were at home. Yeah. And um, we had had enough time. Did you have a lot of like big names on that virtual event during COVID? Yeah, yeah, we did. We had a we had a handful of decent names on the uh, on the virtual event. Do you feel like that helped with the attention? Yeah, I think it did, but also value helps okay. too. You right? So like you bring in a few anchors for the event space. Yeah, yeah. Um, but those anchors are what draws people's attention, and then it's what you deliver mm -hmm. that makes it most important. So then, so then after that second year, you know, you get you have this community that you've built online that. Um, that is worth its weight in gold, and that's the next year we go live again. It was a little smaller because it was still COVID, but um, but we we were ballsy and we went in and we mm -hmm. did we pulled the trigger on a, a live venue, one of the first ones. That so happened. this is your third event. It's our third one. The live venue. Yep. Okay. And that was 2021, and um, and we had about 280 people there, you know, and then um, and then we're like okay, and it was uh, it still seemed like a small stage. And that's where relationships come in. Then I, I, I started reaching out to people that had big stages mm -hmm. that I respected, right? And this is where proximity and people um, come into play. So I started reaching out to like Pete Vargas and Cole Hatter and some of these guys that I respected in the yeah. event space and started asking for their, um, for their recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, um, some of what they gave me, but very vaguely because in, in passing, it's hard to get all yeah. that. Yeah. So you got to be willing to pay to play a little bit too, right? So how we scaled the event space is I um, I gave percentages of my events to um, to partner in partnerships, mm -hmm. um, make it worth their time and in and you learn in doing so. Yeah, and I think sometimes people get too prideful, going, "Okay, well this is my event and I'm not willing to give my profits to somebody else." And the way I look at stuff is, okay, I if I don't give those profits to somebody else and I don't learn this game, I'm going to stay playing at a small level or do something catastrophic that might make me lose money in the space. Mm -hmm. So why not just invest in in the next year's event by investing in this year's event by putting the right people in place that I right. know have are the right people. That's good. And um, and utilizing and leveraging their talents and attributes and paying for them um, to be able to do so. Yeah. Who and are like earn. these partners or like if you don't mind me asking, yeah. who are these partners that you partnered with? I made a huge deal. Yeah, like Cole was a was a was a good strategic partner in the event space. Yeah. Um, he had his Thrive event, and um, and I learned a lot um, by just working with him. And plus, he also introduced me to resources, mm. um, people like his event coordinators, who um, you know, his gal Whitney that actually worked for Tony Robbins for yeah, that many makes a years. Big difference having oh yeah, people. I mean, you get somebody who worked around Anthony Robbins and his big events for so many years, and then they're utilizing them for events. Um, you know, it's it's easy. The event became a lot more palatable 
and easier to actually put on when you have the right people set in place. Mm-hmm. How you actually structure it. There's a there is a business model in the event space of how you deliver on stage to really move people um, emotionally through the whole event mm-hmm. so that their takeaway is massive. Wow. Right? So there's um, a whole formula to it. There's a whole formula to it. And do you feel like if you didn't connect with like Cole, like do you feel like you'll be where you are in the event space? Uh, I get there. Yeah. And I, I might have gotten there like where I was at last year, maybe this year. I, but I would have been running a year, maybe two years behind. I would have figured wow. it out. I mean, that's still a big difference. And I would have got it. But yeah. um, but you're always running a little bit behind, you know. If you, I'm I'm getting older, you know. I, I I'm 49. I uh, I'm gonna be 50 this next year. I just I, I don't have time to waste. So my whole thing is, you got to be efficient with your time. Yeah, you that's know? good. I know there's people like um, Gary V, and he's like, oh, you got all the time in the world, man. It goes fast. Yeah. And so I'm sitting back, going, you don't have all the time in the world. You got to be yeah. strategic, man. You got to you got to use and leverage your time. Yeah. Wisely. Well, obviously, like for someone like you, you. Uh, you were financially successful before going into personal branding. Yep. Where in today's marketplace, a lot of people are broke as a joke yeah, going selling, into yeah, personal yeah. branding. Selling air. Yeah, uh, selling air. But like the amount of capital it takes to do personal branding, like to do it right, it's a lot, man. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of money. Like how, how much have you invested? Like, oh, man. I don't estimate. Exactly like if you were to be like. Several millions of dollars. Um, I mean. I mean, this, I mean, we're spending strong six figures every month, you know, on advertisement now. So, wow. And we, are these uh, ads pushing your events? Are they pushing courses? Like, what are they pushing? Everything. We try them for everything. Okay. So, we, um, so we, we would, we would try cold market, just um, pushing out content in general, just giving out free content so that people would know who we are. We did that for many years with mm. no, no ROI. You know, I think we're a million dollars in ad spend before we even figured out how to make a dollar. Was the but, idea to burn money to figure it out, or were you trying to get a ROI, but it just took longer than a year? I don't think it's ever to just burn money without. <laughs> I, I, I think sometimes you it feels like that, though. When you... But it, it feels like sometimes you don't even know. Like, I didn't even know what my message was um, at first. I, okay. I'm, you're trying to figure out your message. I know the ultimate goal is to raise capital, but like, okay, how do you target these people? How do you. How do you monetize them? Yeah, um, there's so much going on on the back end that people don't even realize. Yeah, um, there's a machine, uh, a, a well-oiled machine on the back end that people don't even see. Yeah, so it's not even just the ads; it's the labor, the the the, the payroll um, burn that you're that you're experiencing between. Do you feel like there's more hands in the fire like now than what you imagine? Like if, when you oh, first yeah. started, did hands you? Hands down. I mean, I thought it was just like building a. You know, you build Turn on a, brand. a Facebook page, right? Yeah, you put on a Facebook page <laughs> and you build some content if you just keep doing it long enough. Because that's what a lot of these guys make it sound like. Like, hey, yeah. you know, just keep putting out good shit. And just you're keep gonna posting. Grow. Yeah, just keep just, just stay consistent at it. That shit don't work. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's like, funny. And, and five years later, you have 10 likes, you know? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's it, there's a, a whole business behind it. The, the CRMs for the back end automation. I got three yeah. employees. I got two copywriters. I got five sales guys. We got um, a, a videographer, two additional editors. Um, a videographer edits. We have, um, uh, I have a COO, a, a chief operating officer that Damn. that manages those guys. I have a sales manager. I mean, there's a whole team. Yeah, so do you feel like it's safe it. to say, like, if you want to do personal branding right, you need to treat your personal brand as a company? Yeah, and we outsourced in the beginning. So people are like freaking out going, holy shit, like I can't afford to do that. Right. Well, you know, we didn't know. So we out we outsourced to third parties in the beginning. It's just that we outgrew um, in our in our scaling. Um, some of the small companies that made sense at the time just couldn't handle the growth of my expectations. Right. You know, um, they could take a small personal brand and they do great as a third party mm-hmm. um, affiliate that that um, – that, can work forever for somebody that's just hosting a small personal brand. It was never my goal, though. My goal was always to go bigger and always to be stronger and always to do things in magnitude. So um, as those companies became inefficient and we outgrew them, they're still friends of mine, but I uh, I started onboarding my own staff. Yeah. And that's, again, where relationships were important because where did I get staff? Uh, when Ty Lopez and them were downsizing, I was poaching staff and mm-hmm. people that they weren't getting rid of because they were bad, just didn't have a need for them in the moment. Right. So we were able to onboard good staff, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, just like anybody, I had to pay, you know, to yeah. get there that proximity to those type yeah. of people through masterminds and everything else. Yeah, and I think what you just shared is really valuable, man, because 
uh, again, a lot of people are still trying to figure out personal branding, but I think the reality is you need to look at your personal brand as a company. You do. Like, number one, yep. you shouldn't be doing everything yourself. Yep. You, yeah, like, I, I just, I see a lot of coaches or people in, like, different industries, and they're doing it themselves. Like, it, it just drives me crazy. It's like, bro, you could scale yeah. 10x if you just leverage. Yeah, and, and what's hard is just like any in industry, there's a lot of uh, bullshit out there. And um, there's there's people that don't really know what they're doing. They're taking people's money, mm -hmm. and I got taken. You know, I mean, I, I gave a guy thirty thousand dollars to do host an event for me, and and I thought it was going to move its weight in gold. I show up, and I'm literally in the hood, out just outside of Crenshaw in L.A. by a Damn. tire shop in this in this uh, event hall, and I, and I'm just sitting around looking around, going, okay, I mean, this place is going to cost more than a thousand bucks. Shitty lunch filled with a bunch of quacky people, you know, 60, if, if there was 60 people there. Wow. And, um, you know, and, and knowing now, you know, not knowing it back then, um, it was a good investment only because I learned a lot from that experience, mm -hmm. right? But um, but a total waste of money, Yeah. you know. Um, great investment to learn um, the hard way, um, but a total waste of money. So you got to be careful, too. And there's people that they can't afford to lose $30,000. You know, we chalk them off as a, as a tax write-off. Um when you're young and broke, it's important that uh, you make every dollar count. So when you're in situations where you're trying to make stuff like this grow, um, what's cool is when you're broke, creativity flows. Yeah. When you have money, yeah. it can almost be a crutch because you leverage your money instead of creativity. Mm, and so um, it, that's a bar. it can affect you or it slows your, your growth down. So, and you have to recognize it, right? And I was, that's what I was doing in the beginning. I was just throwing money at stuff. Mm -hmm. going, I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm going to, I had to make time, mm -hmm. you know? So part of our, our ability to scale came from me slowing it down, stopping, I stopped throwing just money at it. And I actually uh, became very conservative and I had to think back, okay, what was it like when we were building our first businesses? We didn't have that capital. Mm -hmm. like, how, like how do we get creative where this business stands on its own two feet without Jerome deploying money every month into this business to keep trying to scale it. Mm, and this was even good. after two years. Yeah. You know? I mean, it took me a couple of years where I was like, okay. And then and then once we figured out how to monetize it, then we were able to run with it. Yeah. You know, we're still we're still on the infancy stages of running with it, you know? Infancy, bro, you're talking about twenty million with your personal brand. You you feel like that's still the infancy stage? Well we're not there yet, right? So like that's that's the goal. I mean okay. we scale from, you know, a million dollars um in just over a million dollars in gross revenue. I think we did like one point two million in gross revenue last year and then this year we're we're projected to do just under five million. Okay. Since we're sitting at the tail end of the year now, yeah. Um, I, I was hoping to hit over five million. Yeah. And, um, and what do you? What exactly? Where is this revenue coming from? Like, what are you selling to generate events, this? Events, um, events, ticket sales. Um, okay. What's like uh, the net profit on something like that? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a deficit for like tick, on ticket sales. You got to have something to monetize. So our educational platform is what we monetize on the okay. back end, right? Gotcha. So you got to give. You have to. You have to be willing to give to get. Right. And so. Our um, our educational platform is what's bringing in the revenue, mm -hmm. um, but man, um, leveraging testimonials and success stories is, has to be a massive priority. So we have to we've listened. We've changed a lot of what we're doing in the personal brand space. Um, I made a lot of catastrophic mistakes, um, even to this past year. Um, what helped us scale this year was um, we weren't we were we were building a business, but we weren't building a community. Mm, we. That's we were trying to sell, 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 sell. And I listened to Grant, like, oh, you sell everything, sell everybody, sell everything. And then I started uh, looking around at who was coming up, who um, was moving the needle, but, and who wasn't selling air. And then I recognized people like Pace, you know, and I just go, like, is my business model better than Pace? I like my business model better than Pace. I think, you know, um, but his is scalable. Is it Pace scalable? No, Pace is one of a kind, right? Mm -hmm. Can people do put $600 million worth of commercial development on the books like I have. Uh, most people can't, um, you know, but if I can help them make a couple million dollars in their in their professional career doing what we do, um, is that a needle mover for most people? Mm. The answer is yes, right? So so that's the goal, right? And I started paying attention to the fact that, like, people like Pace were, were building not just a brand, but they were building a community. Mm. So I had to change things. Instead of selling people, I said, okay, we're selling people right out of our community because we're trying to force them for like renewals and different things. And I said, we just need to open this up and make it broader because through a community, we can just do so much more. Mm. So 
when I started realizing that, that's how we scaled this year, because people feel it. They feel you're. If you, they they can recognize that you're really trying to do the right thing, um, they know you're make, trying to make a profit. Right. But if you make people feel like that's all you're trying to do, you lose. Mm. So the way we scaled it this year, and we and we got it to just under five million dollars, is we opened our doors and we started embracing the community side of, of what we're doing. Like selling people on a membership or what do you yeah, mean by like, like the one community time, we don't, side we don't, of things? We don't, we're not selling people like on um, renewals. You know, once they're part of our community, we embrace them as part of our community forever. Wow. So, so you know, and then if they want to be a part of our higher level learning stuff, they have that ability to do so, but they don't feel sold all the time. Um, people hate to be sold. Yeah. You know, they, they'll buy what they want and you have to bring the value. If we're doing our job, um, then they're going to want proximity to what we're doing nonetheless mm-hmm. because it's bringing value to them and it's going to be a needle mover in their life. And what we were doing, we were just trying to sell them in all aspects um, just to keep the business growing and, and affluent and it wasn't working. We mm. had we had losing months again. I feel like a lot of people in this space do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so you got to be patient. Look at like, um, and I noticed people like Alex Ramosi and these guys where – I noticed that they were just starting to give their courses away for almost nothing, you know? So, yeah, I think Alex gives this stuff for free. Yeah, for free. Yeah. You know? This looks like I'm drinking a beer. It reminds oh, me of like a Sunday. Death, not beer. Uh, uh, it's, it's water. <laughs> but it looks like beer reminds yeah. me like when I was a kid, my dad having a beer on a Sunday Sunday football <laughs> game funny. or something, you know? So, anyways. Man, that's good, man. So, community was the breakthrough that led you to higher profits and yep. just experiencing yep. more, like, culture. Because I think... And it's easy in this entrepreneur self-development space to make it about a profit and to make it feel like you're just trying to make a transaction. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you have to because it's a business, right? Like, I mean, those people, their payroll doesn't pay for itself. I'm not doing this um, all out of the goodness of your own heart. You know, you, you there has to be a return on investment. Your time is worth, is valuable, you know. So, it, but if you're building success stories, you're giving back, whether people are paying for it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, you're giving back because we don't have to do this. Yeah. You but know? what do you? What, what was the difference though? Because like you had, you know, like what was the difference in terms of building community? Like what was that that strategy? That like what was that one thing you guys yeah, did differently? Yeah, it's keeping retaining people. Like how do you retain people? Um, like if you go if you go someplace and you feel sold all the time, are you going to continue going back? Probably not. Even if you like the product, yeah. are you going to go back if you feel sold all the time? If I'm being sold all the time, no. No, because it, it's, it's uncomfortable, man. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, it's uncomfortable. Um, and I won't either. So turning it from where we were always selling and people felt sold to feeling like they're, like we made them we, – what we had to do is creatively structure the business where they came first. Mm-hmm. Okay, it wasn't our business that came first, and I, and this and it was stupid of me to have even went down the wrong road in the first place. But it just it just goes to show that we as business and entrepreneurs we're not perfect. We forget things, even that we were mentored in. And my my mentor told me years ago. He said, he said the the more you give back, the more money comes in. So you know, and he said if if the, if the people you're selling are nobodies. And you're a somebody, no money in the bank. Mm. But if they're somebody and their first priority and they're making money, then money in the bank. Mm. You got to make your people money. When you make your people money, you'll make money. Mm -hmm. So you just have to remember, like when you build community, it has to be about them first and then yours comes second. You Mm. know, if you make it about you first, um, then you, you put them second, you can't build community that way. But you can build community when you make everything you do about them. That's good, man. I think that's something a lot of people in this space need to hear because again, um, although we need to make a profit as entrepreneurs, we need to also think about the people we're serving. We got to love them more. We need to care about them. We need to make sure they're winning because you're right. Otherwise there's no money in the bank. No, there's not. And And even like real estate agents, if you look at like a real estate agent, for example, um, I'll have real estate agents come up to me often and say, you know, Hey, I'm a new real estate agent. Can you give me any advice? And, um, and I always tell them to learn how to underwrite, but I think the best advice really like for a real estate agent is that they don't, they're not really in real estate. They're, they're a salesperson and they're a transactional broker is what they are. They're just, it's all transaction based. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to sell somebody a house to get a commission. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes about that, 
um, that's why the industry is under fire right now, you know, by the way. Yeah, the National Association of uh, Realtors is under fire. Lawsuits like crazy. They're talking about dismantling it. And it's because um, it's a very transactional business. It's mm -hmm. a very cold and very transactional business. The, the value for the end user just isn't there. Right. You know, because there ain't enough brokers to know what they're doing. So if you think about it this way, like commercial brokers are completely different. So you, a commercial broker, you got they have relationships. Everything is relationship ba based. Ninety percent of what a commercial broker does, uh, pallets into zero. Um, they only ten percent of their transactions actually ever go through, and um, and so those guys are true professionals. They specialize, and, um, and they're not just transactional. They have to be relationship based. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the financial world, right? Like if you're a financial. Um, professional in the pri financial world, um, that stuff's all um, relationship based. Mm -hmm. People have to like you and trust you. Yeah, no, that's so good, man. The relational capital is everything. Yeah. So that's how we've scaled it. And yeah. So we just got to do a better job at it this year to take it from five to twenty. You yeah. know, if we're gonna if we're gonna hit that the the needle in the head, and I might fail at it. And I, there's a good chance I will, but it doesn't matter. I'm still gonna push for it. And if I like I told you earlier, if I hit fifteen million. Um, in the personal brand business, what that means is my reach is getting bigger. My, my deal flows are getting bigger. My ability to raise capital for my real business. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call it. Like, this is my fake business. My real business is my real estate development companies. My fake business is my education business because it doesn't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it's still a challenge, man, and it still gives me bandwidth. So I still love the fact that yeah. what it does for us as far as resources are concerned. Like, what's your drive to build it? Because like we just said, like, your other businesses make you a whole bunch of money. This one seems more of like a challenge. Like, what's the why to, that makes you face these challenges? Yeah, I, I needed to scale. Um, I recognized in, in like 2012 after the 2008 recession that um, – I was doing shit wrong. I, I was working my business like a job. I got too comfortable. The business did well. By 2016, I was so dissatisfied with where I was. I just felt like I had so much more in me mm -hmm. that um, I even felt like my kids were watching me and I was failing them in a fashion that that I, I, I don't think they were, I was really doing them a, uh, any justice of really understanding what dad had really done in early mm. years. I feel like I was just leaving leaving the house, like you work a job, like my dad did, and showing up back home at the end of the day and not really giving them the real entrepreneurial, capitalistic, U.S. American, true heart and blood and tear way of, uh, of what we did and what mm. America was built on, right? I felt very unfulfilled. So I... Um, in 2016, I, I thought, okay, I, I got to scale this. And, and, this, and I told my wife, I said, this is going to be potentially our last hard run that we can physically do. I mean, you know, as you start getting in your mid 40s and your 50s and stuff, you don't want to be running at this level in your mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, you know. Um, and so, not because your body can't handle it. I feel like I'm pretty healthy. I think my body can handle it. But, but why do you want to put yourself that much stress? And why, if you do things right when you're young, why should you have to work to that magnitude mm -hmm. later? You know. So I said, this may be our last hard run, but if I'm going to do it, I'm not just going to do a run to build another, to go buy a bunch of Subway franchises like I had done in the past or build a bunch of coffee shops or, or restaurants and whatever else we've done. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to take it to a new, another level. Mm -hmm. So like my motivation behind this was like, okay, how do I raise capital? Um, how do I really scale this? And I, went, I put my head back down into, the, into educating myself on, on how to take a normal real estate investment and scale it into a syndication, scale it into um, large millions of dollars, not an $8 million project, but how do I get a $70 million project mm -hmm. on the books? And so all of this is part of that. Gotcha. You know, this is all That's methodical a lot of way. there. You know, yeah, yeah, because my wife always, she's asked, we've been tied down to our businesses for 26 years. Now, wow. You know, and, um, and I don't care what anybody says. If you're a real hard entrepreneur, there's no freedom and flexibility about it, man. Facts. I mean, you're friggin' working your ass off always. Yeah, that's a fact. And so those people that say that they're the, uh, the contrary is total bullshit. And so um, you might have monetary times that, that you have some freedom and flexibility, but it is a friggin' grind all yeah. the time. Um, you got to have some resilience in you to do what, I, what I've done and what you're doing, you know, over the course of time. And so, like I tell people, I say, you know, look, at a certain point in time, you have to be able to have choices that's retirement to me because i'll always work till the day i die but like i told my wife my wife just asked me and it's it's a thing that it's one of those things that out of respect you know you work this hard but if you if you're working for the money you're working for no reason whatsoever mm -hmm. it's a friggin' loss because you'll lose everything else in life and um and so as as cool as the money is 
it's the challenge is even better, but even better than that, it's what it gives the people that you love around you the resources to do. And if those resources are, are not even capable of some free time, you've lost. Mm. You know, it's worthless. So my wife asked, you know, my son graduates from high school in two and a half years, my daughter in, in uh, four and a half years, and or five and a half years. And, um, and when they go to college, my wife just said, I just don't want to be married to all the employees. The, the chaos. We travel and we take our business with us everywhere mm-hmm. we go. Um, it feels like um, everything that we do surrounds around the chaos of our businesses. She goes, I just want to know that when our kids graduate from high school and they move on and go to college somewhere else, that we have the ability to pick up and go and not feel like we're restricted to a four day weekend. Or right. you know, if we want to go and spend a month there with them, we can. Yeah. You know, and um, and so that's what all of the driving factors are around what I'm doing now, is to build passive income and it's hard when you have businesses that are successful to be able to replace that where it's all passive but you're still able to live that lifestyle and do what you do because i love the game i love having the expendable income to play the game um i had to, i have to figure out i had to figure out a way to how to replace that mm-hmm. and that's where all this drive came into doing all of this wow man that's that's really insightful i mean you would think like when you're earning millions of dollars like yourself and your other businesses that it's passive that you could just leave but it sounds like you have to have a really good exit strategy exit strategy which i think you're building through your personal brand right yeah and that i am because i'm using it to scale our real estate commercial real estate portfolio okay. we and we would have had an exit strategy but not to the, to the magnitude that we would want it and and the thing is is I'd, I'd made some mistakes like even the way i built my concrete company um i didn't build it to sell it i didn't no one taught me that i was right. never mentored in that space was that your first business you built um, it was the first one that I built independently from okay. the ground up. And so I wish I would have known that I should have built an EBITDA positive co- company. I would have done things uh, slightly different on the way I built it. By the time I figured that stuff out, I was at a place where I was making so much more in real estate and other stuff that the value of my time being spent in that to get a larger return on the resale didn't, doesn't seem to make sense anymore mm-hmm. because I can get, if I put that much energy into my real estate, I can get a lot larger return on that. Got it. So I should have built it that way. But I didn't. So the thing is, is that I, I work too much inside of my business and not on the outside of my business and the structure of the business. So I still land up living and breathing and eating and ma- I'm married to it still. Mm. That's a mistake that I made. I've learned otherwise since then. So now everything that I do is the contrary. Got it. That makes you know? sense. So, um, so, you know, you live, you learn. Uh, no one's feeling sorry for me. There's no violins playing for me. We make millions of dollars in that business every year. It's been the catalyst to everything that we do. Um, and I don't feel sorry for myself. I wish I would, you know, there's some mistakes that I've made in business that I wish I would have changed and did in earlier years. And um, now you just got to, yeah. you got to you figure out how to reposition and do things different as you move forward and scale other businesses. Yeah, absolutely, Don't make the man. same mistake twice, you know? What was the, if you could say, what is the greatest mistake you've made in your entire career? The greatest mistake, I mean, I don't know how great it is. I wish I would have scaled earlier. I, uh, I regret um, idling through the 2008 recession, and I didn't idle through it. When I say it like that, it sounds like I did nothing. I, I, I did a lot. It felt like I was idling through it. I, I wish I would have known then what I know now. And that I was, felt like I was scaling aggressively. I got so scared, Joseph, that like in, when 2008 hit, and I remember it was, it was November, December of 2008, moving into January of 2009, and I literally thought it wasn't a matter of... of um, if we were going to lose something, it was what should we let go first? Wow. And that's how close we got to losing some of it. And I was sitting back going, damn, it's taking this long to build this net worth and the risk I took to do this and to ante up on what I'm willing to lose. It, it sucked. It was a shitty feeling, right? We didn't lose anything, thank God. But we got that frigging close. Yeah. And because of that, though, it plays it plays tricks on you. As ballsy and as um, a, a, an agile as you've been your whole career, because I had my son was born in 2008, you know, he was a baby, wow. and um, we were at a different place. We thought we were going to be able to pull our foot off the pedal and enjoy raising our kids, and we weren't going to have to raise work that hard. God had a different plan. I had, a, I'd land up having to put my head down and work harder than I had ever worked, even since the day I opened my business, just to get through wow. that. So there was a fear factor in me going like, I got a kid now, I got a family, and I, I, I played it too damn safe, man. I fucked up because I played it too safe wow. then. I should have went in, and I, at that time. That's where I should have put my balls on the line. Mm. 
I wish I would have scaled then. I wish I went to wait it till 2016 to start figuring out how to scale. It was like eight years till, later, right? Yeah, you know, I should have I should have done it then. That's mm. when I should have done it. I'd, yeah. If I'd have done it a decade earlier, man, I'd have been in a different place even now. Yeah, I think know? that's a really good principle to learn is like to scale when you are uncomfortable. Yep. And also when like, I feel like as a father, the best time to scale is when you have a baby. Like that drive yeah. is insane. Yeah. I mean, and I think I used a lot of my drive. It wore me out working for free, just trying to clean things up. Mm. And, and, and I can't really give you the recipe of what happened to me mentally um, because I felt like I was fine, you know. But as I look back now, and even when I, I, I remember like distinctively feeling like, damn, if this is like the whole means of everything I've worked, I have fucked this all up because wow. I worked hard. And yeah, we've made money, but I still feel like we're, we hadn't made enough money. And that I still hadn't set my family up right. And what was it all worth if I didn't set my family up right? You know, even though you make some money, like, I didn't feel like we had moved a needle in life. So that's where this second run and the second mm. hard push came from. Yeah, that's good. I think that's a good mindset. Yeah. As, you know, there's a lot of fathers listening to this podcast. And I think if we focus on setting up our family right with our business, I think that's a drive you just can't, like, yeah. It's just such a good drive. Do you feel like that's one of like your drives today? Because I know you've been talking about you want to be able to like go spend time with your kids in college for two, three months. Like when yeah. that time happens, do you feel like that's like fueling you to get to the like that fifteen to twenty mil with your personal brand today? Yeah, but the, the, but we don't make no money on the personal brand. So more of the personal brand revenue is just more. It's more ego than anything just to get there. Yeah. No so uh, if your personal brand is 20 million, like you say you don't make no money. I mean, that's a lot of money. Like, yeah. Is the net like less than 10%? Well, I mean, it just depends. It could be if you spend it all back, you put it all back in. That's like, fair. We've made almost 0% on it because we put 100% back into that's it. That's fair. Right? So we've made, so we don't make money on it. In, in all honesty, we, we need to continue to just scale. I just keep dumping more. The more, every penny we make, we put back into the business. Yeah. Cause, because the fuel that comes out of it funds what I call my real business, which is the real estate business. Yeah. Because I'm able to raise more capital. I have more bandwidth for deal flow. Um, and those, those, you know, we pull two, three, four projects out of the ground that are each $50 million, $60 million, $70 yeah. million dollar deals yeah. that pay for the rest of our lives and gives us the tax benefits that we were able to embrace from our ground-up development. That's, that's real money. Yeah. You know? Man, that's good. So... I'm going to ask you this, man, for everyone that's like listening in that, you know, they're like, man, this is crazy. Like they're talking 20 million. There's no money here. Like for everybody who is venturing into this like personal development space or yeah. personal brand space, like what is, if you were to just like give them one line of advice or maybe two, let's just do two. Like what would those two lines be? Yeah. Don't be all over the place. Um, I learned this, um, from, uh, Sam and Daniel Kwok, the Kwok brothers, um, they helped me with this, really. I, and I've, I've just consulted and paid for consulting with so many people. Um, this is what helped me actually start turning a profit um, that, that I could start utilizing to grow in the brand, is that find out what your, what your true talents and attributes are. Focus on that. Don't be talking about a bunch of quacky bullshit. Become an authority in your space, Ty would tell me this, goes, don't be all over the place, bro, I'm becoming an authority in your space. Just focus on what, what you want to be known as and what people want to take away from you and just drive that until people really know who you are. Mm -hmm. That might take a year, it might take three years, it might take five years. But stay focused on, on being an authority at something, not everything. Yeah, so that's basically, good. don't be a jack of all trades. Authoricize something, an area that you dominate in, and when you become an authority in that space, once people know you in that space, that's when you can start talking about other stuff. Yeah. You know, so if you're building a personal brand, figure out what your attributes are, figure out what the direction you're going, and just stay focused on that until you become an authority in yeah. your space in that. No, that's good. And the second question is, how do you make some money in it? Because obviously, like, you're over here like, there's no money. And I'm over here like, man, is there really no money? Like, it, Yeah, like, I mean, there's money in it, right? Okay. It depends what your goals are, right? So. 
So there's money in it. If I wanted to monetize it and just take a profit from it, I just don't need the money to live on That's um, fair. anymore. Um, so it's more important to me to reinvest that money into into scaling. Got so it. So instead of drawing on that money for profits, I'd re- I'd much rather just use it to. So it's like fundraising for you. Yeah, because it, it's just it helps me with my other company. You yeah. Know? And and the way I look at it is it's a tool. Um, my goal now is, is that we are are in that magnitude of scale, is um, because ladies and gentlemen, truth be told. Um, I couldn't have I couldn't have palated and imagine getting to where I am today if you would have asked me even ten years ago. Yeah, you know, it just uh, things as they evolve, your mind becomes more broader and things become more um, available and realistic to you as you scale. And so, don't get intimidated by the numbers that I talk now. Um, I've had to program my mind around that um, to make them really function and work in my own brain, but. If, if you're, you know, for me, since I don't need that capital f- to live on, I, I can use that capital to scale the shit out of my real estate brand. Mm. And I, and if I, and the reason I want to do that is for my kids, because like I talked to my daughter, my son about it all afternoon yesterday. And it, whenever they're willing to listen, I give it to them because 99% of the time they're not willing to listen to dad. Right. So, um, so the, there's, when now that he's starting to get, get the concept of money he's 15 he's uh starting to uh he's going to start driving and we did a poor job educating them um, entirely about money we use sports as an avenue to be, drive discipline and, and work mm-hmm. ethic and uh so we're a little late at the money game which we should have probably started a lot earlier um so even though they're aware of it um now we're really driving it home yeah. so the personal brand is that we it's taking so much development in time I don't want my kids to have to do that. So I'm going right. to keep it going as long as my kids have interest in doing what I do because it'd be a damn shame if I let it go out of selfish greed because we're wealthy and I didn't ha- allow my kids to leverage what took me so long to build. Mm. So now I keep it and I'm going to keep it going until they decide to do it or otherwise. Yeah. You know? So it's important for me to keep scaling it. Yeah, I think definitely financial like literacy is really good. For kids, I mean, if you were to go back in time, like, what age would you start? Like, what what age would you have started this with your son? Yeah, and I mean, we did. We started. I think, um, and I, we just didn't want it all to be about money either. Um, we wanted to enjoy it. Um, you know, like I look at like Grant, and I, I respect entirely what Grant's done with his girls. But damn, their whole lives result revolve around this. Mm-hmm. Like, I look at that. Is that healthy either? You know, mm. like I want them to. I want my kids to also have their own. Um, their own bench to sit on, you know? So I, I want to give them that freedom. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't have that as a kid, but my parents didn't grow up. We didn't grow up wealthy. My parents didn't come from affluency, and my parents didn't have. So we had, my parents gave to us, but we had, I don't want to call it garbage, but we had less than subpar stuff, mm-hmm. you know? So we didn't have the resources and scale to really go out and do greatness um, to the magnitude that we, I, that I now realize we had the capabilities of doing. So I wanted to give that to my kids first mm-hmm. um, and give them the opportunity to, to draw, lay their own path. But then I also want to be realistic in the fact that, like, damn, we have a resource path here that's a, that's a cash cow. And if you learn it, um, man, it's worth its weight in, in gold in more than one way. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I want to make sure that I also educate them in it. Yeah. So it's time, right? Yeah. I don't know that I would have done any earlier. Um, I think, they would, you know. I think you can always do a better job as a parent. We all jack things up. We screw things up daily sometimes. Yeah, that's um, a fact. <laughs> just gotta love them, man. I, they'll, they'll figure it out. You know? Yeah, they'll figure it out along with you. They're watching. They're watching you, man. Mm-hmm. They're watching you. They know more than you think they know. That's a fact. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So, yeah, my son was like, "Daddy, you do this." I'm like, "What are you talking about? You like, how do you know I do that when I'm on the phone?" I was yeah. like, "Scratch." If I'm on the phone, like, he's like, "Why are you always scratching your arm?" If he's four, I'm like, "How do you know this?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, funny. They, get, they get everything, man. Yeah. They're watching every move you make. Yeah, that's so, so good. Yeah. Man, I know um, I wish we could go longer, bro, but I know you have a hard stop. And yeah. um, I want to ask this last question, sure. and we'll wrap up the podcast. Um, if you were to – okay, let me – I think I have the question. This is the question. If your whole existence in the world was completely gone, like there's no trace of you, but a piece of paper with one line that's framed in the Hall of Heroes for the rest of eternity, what would that paper say? Oh, man. I think it would just say, life is short, get off your ass. 
because life is short, man. Yeah. Life goes by fast. I think the last 30 years, how fast it's went by, and I just go, damn. When you have vivid recollection of, of everything that happened 30 years ago, and you, I look back, I'm going, damn, 30 years just goes by that fast, I'm going to be pushing 80. Life is fast, bro. And so I just tell people, take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. You know, take advantage of it, man. It's I know you hear it, and it sounds cliche, but it's not, man. You, you got... You got to get off your ass. You got to make the best out of every single day. You got to push every single day. Um, my staff probably hates me right now because it's the holidays and I'm on their ass. Um, and I tell them, you know, rightfully so. I tell them, you know, look, guys, if I don't do it, no one else is. Facts. You know, it's this is my job. Yeah. Um, you know, the company's going in this direction. If we're going to keep it going in this direction, we need to pay the fuck attention to what we're doing, and we got to push hard. Yeah. You know, and so um, that's all I would say. Man, that's a yeah. bar. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And, man, I appreciate you coming here, too. I know you got to catch a fight soon. Um, but I just want to thank everyone that's tapped in with this podcast. This is the first episode of Season 2. So if you love what you heard on this podcast, maybe this is the first time you're watching us, make sure you subscribe because we have more fire coming on the next episode. And, Jerome, my brother, appreciate thanks for coming you, on. Yeah.